here this week, will the new Sonny put the shine back into embattled Nissan? We ask why more people don't buy diesels if they're as economical and as green as they claim to be. And you can forget other forms of winter sport. The French put motor racing on ice. Hello and welcome to this new series of Top Gear. We're in Paris, what is undoubtedly one of the biggest and most enthusiastic of classic car shows. The French claim, of course, to be the very cradle of the modern automobile. They certainly celebrated their centenary of its invention at least a year before anybody else did. And if the crowds thronging these hours are anything to go by, they haven't lost their passion for the cars of yesteryear. And there's plenty for them to drool over at this show that they call the Retromobile. Both the well-known marks and some of the less well-known. We'll be looking at one or two of them in more detail later on. But before we move on, just feast your eyes for a moment on this immensely beautiful motor car, perhaps the car of the show, built by Hispano Suiza in 1924 for the young heir to the Dubonnet winemaking fortune, Andre. He'd been a fighter ace during the First World War. This was as close as he could come, perhaps, to a fighter plane without wings. It's built, for example, the bodywork from strips of tulip wood pinned onto an aluminium frame by the very same craftsman who built his uh, Newport fighter plane. In fact, they left their trademark in the door still here. The engine was developed by Hispano Suiza from the very same power unit that powered those fighter planes. It must have been an engine, I'm sure, that Rolls-Royce themselves envied in the 1920s. But it's more than just a car to cut a dash in, if you like, because the young Andre actually raced this very car in one of the toughest of the long-distance car races, the dreaded Targa Florio, and came very close to winning. But more of these uh, gold noddies in a minute or two. Right now, we turn to a rather more mundane piece of modernity by Nissan, the new Nissan Sunny, and Chris Goffey has been casting his eye over it. Over the years, the Sunny has changed and evolved upmarket, as has the competition. The new model is bigger and heavier than its predecessor, and that reflects an industry trend. People want more substance in their escort-sized cars. It's difficult to find a lot to say about the Sunny. That's not to denigrate it. It's a very good-looking car. It goes well. It's very well engineered and put together. And, of course, it's got a tremendous reputation for reliability. But it's hardly brimming with character. It's always been their best-selling model in Britain since its introduction over 20 years ago. And over half a million examples have been registered so far. And, of course, it's one of the world's top-selling cars. Cheap and cheerful, angular little cars with uncomfortable seats designed for small people, distinctly indifferent ride and handling, and a marked propensity to go rusty, they were well-equipped for the money, and they were dead reliable. And that wasn't something you could say about the equivalent British cars. What the Sunny and the other early Japanese cars did was to introduce the public to the concept of a zero-defect car that would run without problems for at least 50,000 miles. It wasn't long before the Europeans had to face the reality that this was a powerful marketing tool. The new Sunnies come in a three-car range. This, the four-door saloon, a hatchback in three and five doors, and also a three-door coupe. Now, under the bonnet are the same engines, 1.4 and 1.6 twin-cam units. And they're all 16-valve units run on unleaded fuel, and there's a catalyst version coming later. Nicely laid out engine compartment, lots of space to get at everything, with the exception of the oil filter that's buried down here. Distinctly European influence on the styling. Like the 300, 200 and Primera models, it's all smooth curves, unlike the angles of the old car. Flush fitting glass, very aerodynamic body, but one aspect you get your trousers very dirty getting in and out of the car. I don't know why, but the underside of the Sunny seems to get particularly muddy. It's a big boot. The Japanese claim 440 litres capacity, whatever that is in English. The rear seats fold forward for long loads and the spare wheel lives under the floor. The hatchback version also has generous load space, although the untrimmed underside of the shelf jars slightly. The jack on both cars is tucked away in a little compartment here, and how on earth you're supposed to get it out on a wet, rainy night, I've no idea.
However, with the driver's seat set for someone of my size, there's very little rear leg room, certainly much less than there would be in an Escort, for instance. It looks as though Nissan has sacrificed this space for the generous boot and hatchback area. On the move, you have to say the new Sunny is a far better car than the old model. The handling is good, the ride is quite comfortable, although I still find the steering a bit dead, especially around the straight-ahead position. The gear change, as you'd expect for a, a Japanese car, is light and very precise, although on one of the Sunnies we drove, there was quite a snatch as you came into second gear. It's not a quiet car either. There's uh, quite a lot of road noise coming back through the structure of the car and uh, despite the aerodynamics there's also some wind noise especially around the mirror area. And there's also quite a lot of engine noise particularly when you're pressing on through the gears. Brakes are powerful and progressive and uh, anti-lock brakes are an option on all models. Despite the uh, exotic sounding specification of the engine with its twin cams and 16 valves it's not exactly a ball of fire you describe the performance as being well up to the class standard but uh, hardly outstanding the cars tend to be bought by private buyers often retired people on fixed budgets so a move up market may threaten some of that traditional customer base Last year, a public row erupted over the Nissan Primera prices. The British distributor accused the Japanese of pricing it too high. Now the row continues over the sunny, only this time the Japanese say the UK distributors are charging at least 15% too much. So to sum up, the Nissan Sunny range is well equipped, boot sizes are good in both saloon and hatchback, and it has good handling. Against it, excessive road noise, the rear legroom is hardly generous, and it seems a bit pricey. The 1.4 comes with Catalyst, the 1.6 will have one as an option in the future, and of course, all versions run on unleaded fuel. Now, back here at the classic car show, let's have a brief indulgence, if you like, with one or two of the very special cars they've got on display here that I personally haven't seen anywhere else. They don't, for example, make them any more like this uh, handsome Bucciale with its lovely low bonnet line, low roof line and those magnificent uh, wheels made of a toughened aluminium silicon alloy. The Bucciali brothers were a couple of engineering geniuses who were really too inventive for their own good. They made a whole string of cars in the 20s and 30s that were so far ahead of their time in engineering terms they seemed to put the customers off. This was their last and in many ways their most conventional model, the TAV12. Even so, it uh, was a technical revolution. Independent suspension on all four wheels, infinitely variable automatic transmission, front wheel drive and of course because they had front wheel drive they got rid of the prop shaft so they achieved this lovely low line. Designers loved them but apparently the customers didn't. Now in the same year that, that Bucciali went on display at the Paris Motor Show in 1930 a remarkable American motor engineer called Harry Stutz died but his name lives on in a number of superb high quality cars not least this uh, Stutz 32. 32 stands for the 32 valves, four for each of the eight cylinders of this engine that could drag this big, heavy drop head coupe along at well over 100 miles an hour. And you can see the powerful combination of the European and American styling, the long, low bonnet line and roof line, coupled with these big American style running boards. A real Dick Tracy car, if you like. But Stutz was a stickler for safety as well as for speed. He introduced a whole string of uh, special safety features like metalized safety glass for the windscreen heavy steel reinforcement on the sides to prevent sideways intrusion and powerful hydraulically assisted brakes to bring the car to a halt. But despite their quality, their immense popularity, Stutz, like so many other small manufacturers, went under during the Great Depression. Now you can't mention French classic cars without breathing the name Bugatti. Ettore Bugatti was perhaps the most celebrated designer of sports and racing cars in the 20s and 30s and the uh, cars he designed for his rich and royal clients make your mouth water with their elegance and style. But this is a Bugatti with a difference, perhaps the least elegant car he ever designed. In fact, it became known as the Tank because of its big rounded front end and these long bulbous extended wings. Came out in 1936 as the Type 57S, aimed at winning Le Mans. It failed that year, but the following year this very car, driven by a man who became a 
French resistance hero. It won the 25 Le Mans race. And it's scarcely been touched since. Still got the protective grills on the headlamps. It's got a, a distinctive third spotlight on the driver's side to light up the inside of the track. And when it came round the bends at night, the spectators knew, here comes Bugatti. If you look in the cockpit, it's scarcely been touched since it came off the track. Now, three cars took part in 1937. Two have disappeared, only this one remains. So it's a very rare Bugatti indeed. Now, in the same year that the tank won Le Mans, Talbot, one of Bugatti's great rivals on the track, produced the famous teardrop Talbot Lago, one of the landmark cars of all time. Teardrop because of its voluptuous, I really can't think of another word for it, aerodynamic styling, the curve of these wings, the line of the roof, the shape of the windows, the long slope of the tail, designed by Figueri and Falashi, the famous uh, Parisian designers. These flush-fitting door handles are one of their landmarks. Inside the same clean and cluttered lines, a real driver's car, provided you're short enough. Notice the Wilson electric pre-selector on the steering column. You just pre-select the gear you want, you come up to the bend, dab the clutch, and the change takes place automatically. Again, not just a show car, because a sister vehicle came third at Le Mans in 1938. flipped on 10 years or so from the age of opulence in cars to the age of austerity you might say and one of the prime thoughts in the minds of the engineers to prepare this prototype little pan hard for the 1948 Paris Motor Show was economy how to get the most for the least it caused a sensation then I'm sure it would now because it takes the teardrop philosophy of aerodynamics to the extreme the whole car if you like becomes a teardrop which is great for the coefficient of drag but it gives you that ridiculously pointed rear end inside the car looks very much like a sort of 1940s Bakelite radio set. Now it was powered by a tiny two-cylinder 600cc engine out of which they squeezed a top speed of uh, over 60 miles an hour and an economy, a remarkable economy, of 80 miles to the gallon. So although the shape may be way over the top, I'm sure there are lots of people who would argue that the figures are what we should be aiming for now in an urban car. Right, let's finish here at the classic car show with a look at what is clearly something of a dinosaur, albeit a rather young one, because this aluminium monster, the Bigata as it's called, was produced in the late 40s, the same time as the Panhard, notable not only for its size, but for its fuel. It was an attempt to produce a viable, high-powered LPG-fueled car. They took a 1932 Auburn chassis, complete with its big V12 engine, so the whole thing weighs about two tons. They put 80 litres of uh, fuel storage at the back end, slightly modified the engine in a way they went, and with some success. They got it up to about 120 miles an hour, and they got about 250 kilometers or so out of their 80 litres of fuel. So an amusing folly, perhaps a dead end, but a real crowd puller when it goes to car shows. OK, now let's jump from LPG to diesel. Here in France, uh, diesel cars make up about one in three of all new cars sold, and the trend is rising. In the UK, it's as low as 6%. We asked Jeremy Clarkson to look into the pros and cons of buying a diesel in the UK these days. One reason for the unpopularity of diesel cars has undoubtedly been their dirty image. They're associated with dirt and muck, whether it's coming out of the exhaust or whether you're putting it in the tank. If you spill this glutenoid stuff on your hands or your feet, the smell stays with you for days. Our petrol company's doing something about that, not least by providing these natty little gloves. And they're putting diesel pumps in a rather more civilised area, not just in a trucker's enclave. The question is, though, is diesel's yucky image environmentally justified? Diesels are said to be cleaner than even catalyst-equipped petrol cars, meaning less acid rain and less destruction of forests. They're fuel efficient, too, contributing less to global warming. But what about those smoky exhausts? Now, all that smoke is actually soot. A diesel engine produces even more than an ordinary petrol engine. That's one without a catalytic converter. Now, that not only makes your washing difficult to keep clean and it makes buildings absolutely filthy, but there's a nasty little rumour around that it causes cancer. Despite many studies, that link isn't yet proven. But the legislators and some of the manufacturers are playing safe. Volkswagen are leading the purge. Their new Golf Umwelt diesel is fitted with a turbocharger that reduces the amount of soot rather than aids performance. 
And a simple catalyst not only removes those diesel smells, but also halves hydrocarbon emissions. So why doesn't everyone buy such an environmentally sound car? Why don't you? Well, the trouble is that diesels, and the Umwelt is no exception, well, they're a bit slow. The Umwelt may be the cleanest liquid-fueled car in current production, but it takes 16 seconds to get from 0 to 60. One way around the problem is to fit a large capacity engine. This is the route Peugeot's followed with the 205, which gets an 1800cc diesel engine, giving petrol-style performance and much improved refinement. Another solution is to bolt on a turbocharger. With such a device fitted, the Vauxhall Nova 1.5 TD outperforms most of its petrol-driven stablemates. And manufacturers are up to the same tricks they've already used to extract more performance from their petrol engines. The Citroen XM turbo diesel has multi-valves, three per cylinder to be precise. Citroen also makes the best-selling diesel on the British market, the BX. Its 1600cc petrol equivalent is just pipped at the performance post by the 1800cc turbo diesel, which is not only a little bit faster than the 1.6 petrol, but it makes all the right green noises too. However, these are the only noises it makes that are right. Even this, perhaps the most refined and maybe even the best diesel engine in current production, is still desperately clattery when it's cold. But never mind that, never mind all the reasons for and against diesel. The main reason why this and other cars of its type are being bought in increasing numbers by the fleet market is fuel economy. The turbo diesel BX is said to do 9 mpg more than its petrol equivalent. With the Montego, the gap is apparently even more marked, some 18 mpg. Diesel cars should also be more reliable. According to the German equivalent of the AA, diesels are only half as likely to have a breakdown. The main reason is that a diesel engine doesn't have any spark plugs, so there's rather less electronic gubbins to go wrong. So if it's more reliable, more environmentally friendly and a deal more economical, surely that's enough to offset a few power and refinement deficiencies. Sadly not. You see, the problem is cost. This Nova 1.5 turbo diesel is £975 more than its petrol-driven equivalent. The Golf Umwelt, more reasonable I'll grant you, but it's still £390 more. And the fuel isn't all that cheap either. In countries like France and Italy, governments impose a lower tax rate on diesel fuel, and that has led to much greater popularity for diesel cars. Oil companies say production costs of diesel and petrol are roughly equivalent. The price differences are down to the level of tax and seasonal changes in demand for heating oil. Because the pump prices of diesel and petrol are about the same in Britain, you have to do round about 70,000 miles before savings on fuel economy offset the extra cost of your car. Now, the only way you're going to get that break-even point down to a realm where taxi drivers aren't the only ones to benefit is if you reduce the tax on diesel fuel. Now, will the government do that? Well, they might if the environmental aspect were suddenly to become overwhelmingly important, but they'd have to if the European community told them to. So, the future of diesel cars in Britain is really in the Chancellor's hands. If he reduces tax on March the 19th, sales will almost certainly boom. If he doesn't, no matter how good the cars get, diesel is likely to remain a niche market. Now, talking of niches for diesel cars, this unlikely looking vehicle occupies a very famous one. It started out in life as an ordinary, rather plain looking Peugeot 404 Cabriolet. As you can see, they filled in the Cabriolet bit with this kamikaze-like pilot cockpit, and there's nothing inside except the bucket seat. Now, Peugeot, one of the first major manufacturers in Europe to introduce a light diesel engine for cars in the late 50s, it didn't do very well for all kinds of reasons. So in 1965, they put a diesel engine in here, put it on a racetrack and drove it flat out for over four days. Covered over 16,500 kilometers at around 100 miles an hour and broke 40 diesel records in the process. And really, diesel sales in France have never looked back since. Now, from diesel cars to a decidedly unusual form of motorsport that takes place in several parts of Europe, including the French Alps, for example, when the weather plummets to well below zero. Tony Mason went there with his uh, thermometer to take the temperature. Chamonix is a small town 3,000 feet up in the French Alps, overlooked by Mont Blanc. It's better known as a ski centre, of course, but for one weekend of the year, it becomes the international capital of ice racing. 
Now, for the past few years of warm winters, both the skiing and the ice racing have suffered from lack of snow. But this year, things were very different. <laughs> Yo, man, let's get out of here. Word to your mother. What makes this event so different is that there are 24 hours of ice racing. To kick off proceedings, the top competitors have to tackle a short hill climb at a neighbouring resort. It decides their positions on the starting grid for the real racing, but already differences were showing. Terje Ski from Norway must have wondered whether his journey was worthwhile. And French motor racing legend Henri Pascarolo gave some spectators more thrills than they'd bargained for. But the real action takes place day and night on a mile-long track carved out of the ice and normally used as a winter driving school. The whole weekend is all a bit of a jolly, attracting stars from all branches of motorsport who come here for the fun of it. From the world of rallying came French rally star Bruno Sabi and his great rival Yves Loubet, sharing their Lancia on this occasion. Yeah, it's uh, very good, very nice for training, you know, it's uh, fantastic for training. And for me, I'm uh, like a virgin on this. <laughs> But what is the technique of driving quickly on ice? I don't know. My professor is uh, Bruno Sabi, and he say he, he learned to me many many things. He say, you do that here, you do that here, and when I arrive, my heart boom boom, and I, I try to to make uh, all that my teacher say to me. <laughs> Bringing up the rear in most races was Henri Pescarolo. Fresh from his Daytona 24-hour win in Florida, he was continuing to find his Ford a real handful. That uh, Ford RS500 uh, seems to be quite a good car for the rally cross, you know, but for, but for such a race on the ice, it's too heavy, you know, compared to all the other cars here. The power is quite good, but the weight is so heavy that it's uh, really difficult, you know. Ice racing is taken very seriously in France, with works teams entering an ice racing championship. Many teams design their own very special cars. In most forms of motorsport, there are all sorts of rules and regulations, but in ice racing, anything goes. Take this Citroen AX, driven by Jean-Pierre Jarrier. It's quite unlike any Citroen you've ever seen before. For a start, the engine's on the back seat. It's a 2.5-litre development from a Formula 2 racing engine. And the car's also got a racing gearbox to handle the 300 brake horsepower. And not only has it got four-wheel drive, it's also got four-wheel steering. Former French Formula One ace Jarrier seemed to lap up the conditions. Hardly surprising, really, since his first job after leaving school was to teach here as an ice driving instructor. The key to success when racing on ice is to keep the power on constantly and adopt a smooth driving style. And as in rallying, left foot braking was much in evidence. Four-wheel drive BMWs have won the last two Chamonix events in the hands of French ice racing supremos Francois Chauche and Jean-Pierre Malcher in their 325 IX. This is really marvellous. It's just what the organisers prayed for. It's now time for the night racing, and as darkness started to fall, we had even more snow. In fact, in the last few hours, we've had two or three inches. Now, racing on snow at night is difficult because of the glare from the lights, but when the stuff is falling out of the sky as well, well, then it does give the drivers something to think about. Whether day or night, each race lasts 30 minutes, and just to confuse everybody, the organisers vary the direction in which the cars go round the track. For poor old Henry Pescarolo, it was all far too much. He was causing much confusion as a mobile chicane as the leading cars lapped him. To add to the general chaos, the drivers have to change over halfway through each race. And so do their passengers, whose primary role appeared to be that of providing ballast. In fact, it was real pandemonium in the pits. Whether the spectators actually know what is going on is a moot point. But they seem to enjoy it and they turn up to brave the elements in their hordes. 
In fact, over 17,000 came to see this event, which is very much a part of French motorsport. It's been going since 1970. During the night, even more snow fell, requiring all the assembled snow-clearing resources of the Chamonix Town Council to maintain the track. So heavy were the falls of snow that there was danger of an avalanche, and the organisers cleared some of the spectator stands, although they didn't seem so concerned about the welfare of the drivers. Interspersed among the main races, there's the chance for other drivers in lesser vehicles to have a go. This is the two-wheel drive class, where there's a lot more physical contact. And don't expect any special treatment just because you're driving a Porsche. Back to four-wheel drive, but at a somewhat slower speed. There's another class for off-road machines. It includes virtually anything from Mitsubishis and Suzukis to the odd Fiat Panda. If you wondered why these drivers can start, stop and drive round corners with little apparent difficulty while the rest of us grind to a halt or crash into each other at the slightest sign of snow, well, this is the answer. These are studded tyres. 200 of these small studs are injected into the tyre at the factory. They're made of a special metal which is said to be nearly as hard as a diamond. They cut through the snow and pierce the ice, but such are the demands of ice racing that one 30-lap race can finish a set off. By the end of the second day's racing, in temperatures down to minus 15, it was clear that the drivers were becoming exhausted. Even among the professional classes, the cornering was becoming rather ragged. Some of the contenders, like Messrs Vincent and Ballas in what looked like a Lancia Integrale delivery van, didn't seem to know where they were going. And others, like young Monsieur Belmondo, son of film star Jean-Paul, seemed tempted to give up the ghost altogether. Once again, the Chamonix ice race was won by a BMW. This time, the M3 of French hill climb champion Marcel Thalès with Christian Debias. This was another oddball car with the engine in the middle and the gearbox in the back, but obviously just the thing for driving on ice. Well, that's about it for this week. Before we go, however, let's just save one more example of the sumptuous cars they have on offer here. This bright red monster is the 1937 V16 Cadillac. It was ordered, fittingly enough, by the son of a wealthy brick manufacturer in Switzerland who wanted nothing less than the biggest car in town. The V8s and V12s on offer from uh, Hispano Suiza at Bugatti just weren't big enough, so he went for the Cadillac. The bodywork is by that celebrated Parisian pair Figuieri and Falashi, installed, however, by Hartmann in Switzerland, and his nameplate is actually in the cockpit. And that's really all this car is, a huge engine, those big swooping wings, this relatively small cockpit. You had to have a car following along behind with the flunky and the suitcases. Well, next week we're at the first major motor show of the year in Geneva. We road test Mitsubishi's new offering in the executive class, the Sigma, and we pit the Range Rover against its new rivals, the revamped Mercedes G-Wagon and the Toyota Land Cruiser. So see you then. Until then, drive safely. Au revoir, mes amis. Top Gear is repeated tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock.